or Scientology. All right. Hey, live listeners and hey, podcast listeners and hey, people on YouTube. Thanks for tuning into this special broadcast slash recording, whatever. I'm just going to get right to it here. I got Doug Kramer, a former Scientologist on the horn with me here. Uh, Doug, how you doing? Not bad, Dave. Thanks for having me, my man. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we had, we, it was a struggle, but we got it. We got it going today. I know, man. We want to talk about the power outage and everything else. <laughs> yeah, had, that was so fucking, I mean, I'm so glad I had like a big stack of content on Thursday night because if I'd have like just been like, oh, I'm just going to do this interview, like I'm always like super prepared. So it, was, it wasn't a big deal, but it would have been like, it would have been great to have you on that show. But maybe we'll have you on sometime for to do a couple videos and whatnot. Before we get going here, um, maybe people who are watching this don't know who you are or anything about you. So before, maybe before we get started and kind of get into the weeds here, can you tell people a little bit about your history with the cult of Scientology and maybe a little bit about how it was in the process of leaving and like right after you got out? Yeah, sure. That's a long story, but I'll try to condense it. So basically, my dad got into it when I was around nine or 10 years old, somewhere around there. And I talked about it briefly in, in one of the videos, but he left home uh, one day as my dad and he came back like I described it like a robot. He had he was a different person. He uh, didn't have any life in his eyes. He was talking like a robot and he um, suddenly wanted to do this thing called Scientology and was trying to explain to my mother how he needed to borrow a pretty good chunk of money from a relative in order to get started on it. So that was our introduction to Scientology. It took me a few weeks to understand what was going on. My dad apparently was learning uh, certain Scientology drills. I don't know if your listeners will be familiar with it, but one of the first drills that you learn the communication drills. So he was learning how to do TRs, and he was doing weird shit with me around the house. So that was my first introduction to kind of understanding what my parents were arguing about and what Scientology was about. Long story short, my mom ended up getting indoctrinated into it because that's how it works. Once one family member gets into it, it's definitely going to spread like cancer to the rest of the family. There's no such thing as Scientology invading your family and not having other people get into it. It's that serious. So anyways, my mom got into it. And then um, after a series of um, indoctrination since I was a kid, which started out just helping out my dad on the e-meter, he'd give me some quarters to go play video games if I'd sit down there and do his auditor training with them as a kid. And then it went from that knowing it was complete bullshit and weird for 10 years to right out of high school uh, during a vulnerable time in my life when a lot of cult members get captured, you don't know what you're doing, who you are, what you want to do. Um, I really took to it. And there's a whole story behind that, but I want to keep it moving. So once I got into it in my early 20s, I um, shortly moved out to Hollywood after that. A few years later, I went to the Celebrity Center in AOLA I was immersed in it. That was my community, my friendship. I did Scientology every day. And um, at the time, I thought it went hand in hand with acting. I ended up eventually getting some roles, becoming an actor. And I thought my life was perfect. I had absolutely no idea that there was anything wrong with Scientology. It's hard, it's hard to get this across to people from the outside that see it as stupid. But when you're in it, you have to understand that it's... When I came out of it, I, I'm still to this day, like it, it's, it's pretty shocking at how real that reality is once you're hypnotized and you believe in it. So long story short, a friend from my acting class when I was uh, around 33 years old, this is in January 2008, I remember it. He had found out I was a Scientologist. He was in my acting class and he dropped off a stack of books one day. And the very top one said Combating Cult Mind Control by Steve Hassan. I had it sit there for hours. I was going to write him up at the church, you know, about the KRs. I was going to write a knowledge report on him. How dare him suggest I was in a fucking cult. I know I'm not in a cult. <laughs> so it's just sitting there, man, for like um, hours on my desk. And I'm going, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to read this stupid fucking thing and see what this dickhead, you know. Are we allowed to curse? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, for okay? sure. Okay, okay. I'd be, I'd be fucking, uh, I'd be mad if you didn't like at least drop a couple. <laughs> just checking, my man. I don't want you to get, get you in trouble. 
anyways, I'm almost done here. So long story short, I sat looking at that, that book for hours, um, just pissed off at this guy. I mean, I was, you have to understand it's, uh, you know, you're not in a cult. So how dare this guy? So I finally picked it up just for the hell of it. And I would say within less than an hour, because there was a Steve Hassan broke down this thing called the bite model. So it enabled me, it enabled me to see, you know, you know what that is? Yeah. I, I, I forget what it stands for, but yeah, it's a, the, the basic, the very basic kind of overview of what a cult is and, and what it does and how it operates. Like you can, exactly. you can apply this over groups. And if, if the group applies, it's possible that what you're dealing with is a cult. It's not for sure. Exactly. Not necessarily, but let me tell you when it came to the bite model and then the rest that I read, Scientology was like, you know, had red flags all over it. It might not be that way with other groups, right? It's not just that, you know, you know what I mean? You have to use discernment. Anyways, really though, it was that bite model, which stands for behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotion control. That's what Scientology has drilled specifically to shut down your emotions, control your behavior. It's all about thought control and it will, um, it'll literally remove your emotions and make you into a sociopath. Um, and I hate to admit it, but it did that to me. It was the biggest shock uh, when I read that book and I started to recover was the emotional content that had been suppressed. Uh, my man, I don't even have words to describe it because I felt I spent 10 years uh, crying and wanting to kill myself and going through uh, complex post-traumatic, you, you fucking name it, dude. I suffered it for 10 years. It was like being on acid for 10 years and you can't turn it off. And the only way you can get through it is to not kill yourself and try to keep deprogramming every day. That's how bad it was. So um, anyways, a happy ending. I don't feel like a Scientologist at all anymore. I'm sure that I'll be depro deprogramming in some form for the rest of my life. But I'm definitely a completely different person. Like when I look back 12 years ago, when I woke up and I look at who I am now, it shows me how fucked up that cult really is. And also, my man, I was listening to your podcast that we were supposed to be on the other day. And I was watching that lady that was talking about that study tech. And you were like, you were hilarious, man. I mean, you were just just watching you take it apart. It just as Scientology would say, re-stimulated me. It brought back so many memories, bro, of just how fucked up my childhood really was. And, you, and watching you critique that, that lady trying to t teach about how to be so controlling over your kids when they're growing up. That's what I noticed about that video. And I was like, I went through that and that wasn't normal. I, like, it's such a trip, my man. Anyways, that's my, that's my story in, in a nutshell. So, what I wanted to, when, when your friend gave you that book, it sounds like you didn't feel like a belief system was being attacked, but that your identity, your humanity was being attacked when that Absolutely. book was given to you. Is that, is, well, that's that, how, is, mm -hmm. that, is that fair to say? Absolutely. Any cult member would say that because when I tried to get my parents out, the brief moment that I had to be able to talk to them, and I understand this, it doesn't feel like you're attacking their belief system. Being a Scientologist, if you were a Christian, a, a Mormon, whatever, that's your identity. And you're, when you're trying to take that away from somebody, it feels like you're killing them. Like I felt like I was dying. You really have to do die, die a death and give up that old identity. And that's what keeps, keeps people so attached because it's almost less traumatizing to stay in the mind control and not know that you're in it and to snap out of it because then the real adventure begins, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Or at least your own perception of trauma, right? Because while you're in the cult, you're being traumatized. But you're not like you're but not. You don't know it. You, yeah, you're not. You're not like so aware of it. The video. Were you talking about the video of of that? There's this. We we found the uh, we found these people. They run like a family center for Scientology. <laughs> is that is that the one? People. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the lady that was sitting there with the green volumes, and you just <laughs> you said you said this is the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. And she was dictating about how you raise kids and you need to control them and do this, that, the other thing. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. I do. I wasn't that drunk. Right. But I do remember that she was like telling the kid how to respond to something <laughs> Yeah, like exactly yes. like verbatim how to respond to something. And like you could there's things you tell your kids not to say and not to do. You tell your kids not to call people the N word or not to be rude to like, yeah, not, not to call, you know, not to call people fat or ugly or anything like that. But you you don't train them to like specifically repeat a phrase when someone asks them a question because that's weird you do as a scientologist yeah i how old were you when your father joined the cult about nine or ten men let me i have a little story on that if you don't mind if you want oh, me to tell you means. real quick like 
this is some of the stuff that you uh, brought back in that video that I was thinking about, like, because I didn't realize how I thought my childhood was normal as a Scientologist, because that's all I know. But as I get more distance from it, it's, it really is. Abs- it's super controlling, man. It's like growing up at, uh, like in the military minus the military, but it's very militant. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm sorry. What, what were you talking about, my man? What was the oh, point? No, I was just wondering how old you were. Yeah, you were. You know, that's not right. that's not really old enough for for someone to make their own decisions like in that kind of way. So there's like no, no way, man. Did you? And, and you look when, at your when you got out. Thoughts. When you got out, did you feel like guilty or maybe feel like you were stupid when you were a kid or any of that? Did any of that? Because I imagine that that's irrational, but it's still going to cross your mind, right? Can you tell me about what you mean specifically about by did I feel guilty guilt over like what specifically? Because there Just was a maybe, lot of guilt. Maybe guilt, maybe guilty over being gullible or guilty over being being sucked into something or maybe not guilty, but felt like maybe maybe you were stupid. I mean, it's irrational because you were nine or ten. But like, I, right, I, right, I understand right. that That's like trauma makes us think irrational things. So. Totally. You know, my, my first thought when you said that is I didn't actually ever really feel stupid because remember that bite model that I was telling you about, and I read mm-hmm. that book and I, I recognized right away that this was something that we're not taught. And it's, if you don't, it's like a weapon being used against you. And if you don't know about how your mind works and hypnosis, because everything that Scientology does, the training, all the auditing, every single thing is covert hypnotism called something else. That's the big secret. And they don't stress that enough. And they make us look like idiots because it's like putting someone on a stage show, putting them in a trance. And if you can hypnotize that person, it doesn't make them dumb. They're going to act like a fucking monkey as long as they um, have that implant in their mind. That's, that's really what he's doing to you. So you're, when you look at Scientologists, you're not looking at idiots necessarily. And also the people that um, are most captured by cults actually have to have somewhat of an intelligence. Otherwise, the mind control won't work. It's complex, my man. But what I'm trying to say is I didn't feel guilty because I recognized the cleverness of the mind control in that book. And I realized there's no fucking way I would have known that. And I was really I just did a video about this today about how pissed off I was that you're not taught about this in school. You're not taught about this in basic psychology. How the fuck are you supposed to know this if you're not taught how to defend yourself against sophisticated uh, mind control weapons? Most people would say mind control doesn't even exist if you bring that up to them. I tried to bring that up to a psychologist that my acting teacher sent me to. And I'm like, all fucked up and like, you know, didn't know who I was. And you need to go see a psychologist and all that. I was down. I went to several of them. I would bring up, um, they wanted to talk about childhood trauma and I'm trying to educate them with Steve Hassan's book and shit I was learning. So I didn't feel stupid. I did feel a lot of guilt um, over how I treated people while I was in that trance because you just, I mean, my man, that was the hardest part. All the friends I lost, I, I left a girlfriend. I left, I mean, it fucking destroyed my life. So there was unbelievable regret. And there's this thing in Scientology called the conditions where if you do something bad, you make up for the damage. Well, it wasn't a Scientology training that made me want to make up for the damage at this point. I legit went around and started to inadvertently and automatically apologize to people, try to make up in friendships, try to, for years, just feeling my guilt came from what I did and who I was and what an asshole I was and what a sociopath I was by being in that trance. Were you, um, were you attending public school as like, like regular or? Were, was that not something you were allowed to do as a, as a kid in the cult? Yeah, a couple of people have asked me that. No, I was a public member, which means I did everything a normal person did. I went to school. I looked normal. I act normal. Behind the scenes, there was a, this insidious indoctrination happening. In other words, I'd go to school and be a normal child. And then every once in a while, my dad would take me to the Oregon Santa Barbara of Ventura, put me on the cans and ask me if I ever pulled the air cover off of the planet. You know what I mean? When I'm a kid. That's a real question, by the way. Have you ever pulled the air cover off of a planet? Can you, do you, do you have any idea what the fuck that means? Yeah, I do. They believe in past lives. <laughs> okay. I know all about this shit, dude. Fire me any question you want. I've been studying this crap for years just to get it out of my fucking head. Yeah, man. What the basic idea is not long into Scientology auditing, you're going to go past life. And when you go past life, it's actually about implanting false memories. So you actually make shit up while in a trance, but you believe that it's real. None of the past lives that I, and I did hundred, I mean, you're totally 
believing in all this shit. Past lives, you pull up in your auditing sessions after a while, no problem. I can honestly tell you that 100% of those memories were complete bullshit. And they're literally uh, implanted while you're in a trance. So um, when he asked, have you ever pulled the air cover off of a planet when I'm 10 years old while he's doing his auditor training? And I'm just trying to get to the arcade because he's going to give me some fucking quarters after this shit to go play some video games. And it wasn't just that. There was other weird questions. And that did weird me out, man. Um, but I didn't know what I was involved in because you look up to your father like and mother like they're God. So you do what they say. Period. End of story, you know? Especially at so 10. It means, yeah, exactly. So what it means is it's a given that you have past lives. It's a given that um, all of this shit's, it's just a given in the world of Scientology. So when my dad was asking me, have I ever pulled the air cover off of a planet? Even as a kid, it's assumed that you're a reincarnated being that already has mass intelligence. You've, I'm sure you've heard this before. you lived many times before. So the responsibility that's thrust on your shoulders as a kid is ridiculous. Like you're just, there's no sympathy. There's no, um, it's very unloving. I'm not saying my parents don't love me. It's just hard to do as a Scientologist because of their indoctrination. So um, all this was normal to me, believing in this shit. Um, and so if you believe in past lives and you're an all-powerful Thetan or spiritual being, then as a nine-year-old, it's not inconceivable that last lifetime I was so powerful that I just decided to postulate or have a whim that, yeah, I don't want this fucking planet to exist anymore, so I think I'll just rip the air cover off of it. This is standard thinking with the Scientologist, my man, at a certain level. Did you, um, <clears throat> so they have the, they have the bridge. I know about the bridge. Mm -hmm. I have, I think that most people who've looked into Scientology, most of the people who are going to be listening to this or watching this know about the bridge. So maybe we'll skip that mm -hmm. part. And if you don't know what it is, just look up the bridge to total freedom, Scientology, find some shit on YouTube about it. There's going to be some funny people talking some funny shit about it. How far up that bridge did you get? I got up to the infamous level of OT3, which is depicted perfectly on South Park. Perfectly. So they, how old were you when they told you about fucking Xenu? Mm, it sort of been in 2005, 2004 when I did the level and I got out and woke up in 2008. So late 20s, early 30s, something like that. And I did believe in it 100%. And what people need to understand is that there's so much space opera indoctrination by the time you get up to that level. And your critical thinking is so shut down. You're not sitting there trying to do the math as to whether or not, what, 76 trillion years is even a thing. I mean, was the earth even around that long? That's not going through your head. People have to understand that the indoctrination is so extensive and the security checks that you're put through. I mean, it's almost impossible just to get on the level even when you pay for it because they put you through a lot of shit. Man. So you're so brainwashed. By the time you get up there, 20 years deep, sometimes 30 years deep for people to get up there, a few hundred thousand dollars, sometimes a million. You have to understand the investment that you have. So I also was totally believing in all that fantasy shit anyways at that time because of the continual indoctrination that I, I and I think a lot of Scientologists, I'm not alone, completely just accepted it. You, you, you would because it's not that far out from the shit from pulling the air cover off of a plan. I heard that when I was nine. So how is Zeno any more or less insane than that? Really? Yeah. And I also think, and maybe, maybe this is just like speculation or whatever, but I also think that people who might think, Hey, wait a minute. I think they may be suffering a little bit from the sunk cost fallacy after they've spent so many years of their life and so much money that yeah. there's, that they're like, well, this seems weird, but maybe there's something to it and I'm going to stick with it. Cause I, <clears throat> I just imagine that some percentage of people are like, Hmm. But then, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I've been doing all this work. I'm saving the planet. And so, you know, it's like when you, you know, just something simple, like if you buy a fixer upper house and things keep breaking, keep breaking, keep breaking, you don't sell it. You want to fix the house because you're deep into it and you don't, it doesn't occur to you that like, no matter what it is, a relationship, a financial arrangement, a job, you know, or a cult, we're, we're, we want to finish what we started and we feel like right. that if we cut and run, we're going to lose everything we invested in the thing that we started. And we don't realize that maybe that's what we need. And so I think they're preying on a little bit of that. You know, they, they don't like mental Definitely. health, but they're preying on that sunk cost fallacy that, that is like ingrained in us probably that's to probably to true, man. probably evolutionarily. It's probably to maintain the family unit or whatever. So you don't just leave your mm -hmm. wife and your kids when things start to go but it's wrong. It's twisted by cults and manipulative people and psychopaths. Yeah, exactly. You know, you nailed it. And actually now that you were talking, I, you know, subconsciously, of course that was there. 
I mean, because I suffered that when I finally realized, not even by choice, that my, like I said, my, literally my entire life was a lie and I had to rebuild from scratch in my, you know, my early 30s. Um, I, I definitely, um, it's very, very hard to give up that investment because you're not only the money, the time, I mean, I, and then you have to spend time, 10 years now getting rid of it. And then you're going to lose your family. It's unbelievable. No wonder people fucking stay in. I mean, I probably would have stayed in my, I, I probably would have stayed in a lot longer, maybe my entire life, if, if my friend hadn't dropped that fucking book off. That was a miracle, man, because even though subconsciously something was happening for a couple of years where I knew something was wrong with my life, there was so much stress building up, but I had no idea it was Scientology. I, it's the last, it's right in front of my nose, but I never even considered it. But in the back of my mind, I realized looking back at events from today, I was doubting, but I wasn't consciously aware of it. And by some miracle, the friend drops off the book. And by another miracle, I actually read the fucking thing. So a concatenation of miracles came together. And maybe things do happen for a reason. Um, because God damn it, man, I thank him to this day. And I would, I would give, I would, I mean, I, this shit almost killed me, man. I mean, I wanted to kind of do the suicide thing and a starving living out of my car. It was a nightmare, man. But I wouldn't fucking take away anything, even death to go back to that situation. I mean, that's, if there ever is a hell, that's the experience of what it's like, seriously. When you snap out of it, it's so bad that it's, it, you can't even put it into words, but when it's ironic that when you're in it, you feel no pain. It's like, um, what did Alice Huxley say? You're gonna put people to sleep, you know, they'll love their servitude, they'll fucking eat it up, they'll want it. It was like that, man. It's like Stockholm syndrome, but you have no idea you're in it, bro. So yeah, there's definitely an enormous loss. Well, you were, you were saying that you were stressed out, right? <clears throat> my, my guess, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, my guess is that when you were stressed out, the thought process may have been, well, I'm not doing my, you know, au enough auditing. I need to work the, I need to work, you know, I need to work the L. Ron Hubbard material. I need to do this more because this is what's going to help me relieve my stress. Because that's what you'd been told since you were 10 years old, is that this is the way to as they have that stupid show on their 24 hour network, the way to happiness or whatever. Right. And they, so so they but you've been at this point, especially if you were involved in the celebrity center, you'd been exposed to like probably some fairly successful people who seemed very yeah, happy and were very involved in Scientology and were, you know, doing exactly. everything maybe that you wanted to do. Cause you, you know, you're an actor. And so you, exactly. they, they probably, the, there's probably a bit of the dangling and maybe not Tom Cruise specifically, but of people who are like higher up the food chain than other actors in the, in the organization. They're like, Hey, look, this person has kept Scientology working and that has kept them working and they're happy. Um, I have to assume that that's, especially if you were involved in entertainment, I'm assuming that was part of the manipulation, right? Well, yeah, I mean, definitely with someone like Tom Cruise. I mean, that guy's manipulated like a motherfucker to promote for Scientology and get it, get his ass out there and make sure he stays in there. I mean, the things they've done to that guy to keep him, because he almost kind of creeped out at one point. But um, it's a combination of things. I mean, they definitely subtly and not so subtly promise or suggest that if you get into Scientology to help you out with your acting career, your, your music career, whatever. It's obviously known out here in LA, especially with the Celebrity Center, Tom Cruise and John Travolta, Kirstie Alley, uh, that chick Elizabeth Moss. I mean, isn't she in a show about cults and shit? And she's in a cult. I mean, talk about irony. They, it's like, um, I, I gotta say, most of the people I don't think are necessarily, I mean, it's, it's, it depends on the person. I can't say percentage wise, but a lot of people are actually in there because they believe in it. They're not necessarily just trying to get ahead and all that. That could be the lure that gets a young actor or an artist that moves out here to LA in. But after a while, they're going to be Scientologists and it, it dominates kind of everything else. And business and career and everything goes hand in hand because Scientology promises an answer and a way for everything. And they're very good at helping you out with your business. If you, everything on the surface of Scientology, at least the lower level shit, look, is very clever in terms of almost looking legitimate. But there's traps built into all of it. As an example, the study tech, they teach you never go past a word you don't understand. Now, that's, and if you do, you're not going to understand the rest of the sentence. Now, that almost makes sense, right? I mean, that doesn't sound harmful. It's just good advice. But the way that they use it to mind control people and absolutely fuck with them by having to look it up every goddamn word. And there's a whole thing called study tech that just 
just spins you around. But it, on surface level, like most of Scientology courses at the beginning, they look innocent and innocuous. So it's when I say the kind of shit I say, unless you go through the whole trap and you know what it's about, you could really take issue with someone that's maybe as aggressive or as antag or is not, I'm not, I'm not antagonistic and I don't have any problem with Scientologists. I have a problem with the structure of the mind control and the manipulation. I don't have a problem at all with the people. I'd love to get them out. They're good. Almost all of them are in the same situation I was in. I was just lucky enough to get out, man. I don't consider myself uh, any different than that, man. I could still be in there. So I don't know if I just rambled with my brother, but we're I'm good. Not. We're good. We're good. You're here to, you're here to tell your story. This, that we're not super structured around here. I will, I'm, yeah. I'm curious. What did you know about the Sea Org while you were in the, um in the Scientology oh. organization? Like, like not what you know now, but what did you think you knew about the Sea Org when you were in the uh, in in the cult? It's totally different than when you get out because I'm aware of all the abuses. I'm aware that they're it's basically human traffic. Now let's just call it what it is, especially when they get the kids. So I have a totally I understand what it is now, but you have to understand in there you look up to Sea Org members. You don't know that they're starving. You you are aware that they work hard hours, but they always put on a smile on their face. And they never show their problems to the public, which is what I was. I was only on staff for, I signed a two and a half year contract, but I couldn't even last two days. So I like fucking took off. That's another story. But the CR was always trying to recruit me at Celebrity Center, especially. I mean, every other day. And they're brutal, man. I mean, there was a couple times when I almost did it. But the only thing that kept me not doing that is like, I need to be a fucking actor. Not because I want to be famous, because I, I really wanted to express myself. I'm like, if I give this shit up, I'll go fucking crazy, but, but they would, they would make it seem like you're a piece of shit or just trying to do your acting career when you could be saving the planet. And I know it sounds ridiculous from the outside, but these guys work their ass off. They do do spectacular things uh, seemingly because of the feats that they can achieve by just working to exhaustion. And you salute that. You look up to that. You want to be like that. You don't see them as abuse members, as people that have been human trafficked, starving. I didn't know any of that because of the plastered face, the PR they keep with the public, and they're gung-ho like military people. They work hard hours. They kick ass. You, we looked up to them, and they would make you and manipulate you ruthlessly. I mean, they could almost get anybody to join just with their unbelievable persistence, locking you into rooms, Please see the Sea Org slide. It never fucking stopped. And I would, I would go home so many nights from the Celebrity Center, a good day on course or whatever. And then these fucking Sea Org members would try to, you know, guilt trip me. They'd take me up to the top of the Celebrity Center, have me look out over LA and say, dude, you're not clearing the planet. You haven't even fucking made it as an actor. You could be helping us here. Look at all the people out here in LA and look at what we're doing. And they'd make you feel like such shit that I, I came so close and I go home at night just going, am I doing the right thing? Trying to selfishly pursue my dreams. I mean, maybe I should fucking clear the planet. They really fuck with your head, man. Was the, um, not specifics of the criticism, but were you indoctrinated as to what kinds of people might criticize Scientology when you were inside of Scientology? Definitely. In this fact, is the meat. Uh, this is this is the juicy part. What did they say? What what, they, what kind of well, stuff did they, they tell you? Well, what specifically are you asking? I want to make sure I don't ramble. Oh no, no. I mean, we've got we've got time. Um, like I know they weren't like this is what this person is saying about the cult, right? Because they don't even want you to be exposed to the particulars of the criticism. But what what was like the messaging around maybe suppressive persons? Basic way that I was programmed was to despise the outside world. I and mean, I mean that literally, like you, I would pretend in science, I'm not saying all Scientologists, but this is, this is a general indoctrination. You definitely feel superior. You definitely know you're the only one with the answers and everybody else is just not a Scientologist yet. And until they are, they are looked at, I didn't, this is what I'm ashamed of, man. Like I really did look down on people big time and all Scientologists do. Because there's no point in engaging with other Scientologists, really, because you're trained to think of them as, um, this is what happens when they take your emotions away, my man, and they start making you into a sociopath. It's, it doesn't become a problem to start hating and to shut your heart down. And um, that's, that's um, they basically 
everybody's in some form a suppressive. Um, this, these are my own words. This isn't a uh, doctrine, but everybody's kind of looked at as some form of a suppressive until they get on the goddamn bridge. And um, because think about it, if you know you're the only one with the answers and they have to get up to clear and try this auditing to get rid of their subconscious or their reactive mind, when you know that for a fact, all you see are reactive minds around you and you see what you think are children. The irony, of course, is you're the child, you're the one that's been dumbed down, you're the one that's stupid. And yet you actually look. So anybody that criticizes you, it does, not only doesn't bother a Scientologist, you actually just look down on them even more. It reinforces the indoctrination. So I'll give you an example. Like when my friend would drop that book off, I was really going to write a knowledge report on him. I was doing a play and right next door, they were doing a spoof on Scientology. So I quit the play. It, it had nothing to do with ours. It was next door. I wrote up the, um, the theater company to the celebrity center doing good deeds, shattering suppression, man, by not fucking going next door and, and doing my play. And I mean, what does it, what, what was that a stand for? I mean, I didn't have any effect, but you're trained where you're afraid of why you're the most powerful people in the world. Simultaneously, you're afraid of everybody. And um, there's suppressives everywhere. Like I said, almost the whole world is uh, some, some form of a suppressive until they become a Scientologist. So um, I would write people up. People write me up. I wrote family members up. Fucking family members wrote. It's George Orwell's 1984, dude. It's snitching culture. It's full-on Orwellian control. And I'm not exaggerating. I know you know this. So just think of that mindset and how you would look at the outside world in general and how you would deal with suppressives. And when Tom Cruise said, one day, you know, we hope there won't be any fucking suppressives, wouldn't that be great? He fucking means that, bro. That video was wild. That video was a it big was turning scary. point, too, in the, uh, in the Internet versus Scientology because they, they basically took down everybody but Gawker. And Gawker was like, no, nah, we're not taking this video down. I love that moment. That was great, man. And, and then uh, eventually Hulk Hogan and Peter Thiel took out Gawker, but that's a, that's a story for a different show. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of like, were you encouraged not to have friends at school when you were a kid because they weren't Scientologists? Let me tell you how that played out. Uh, me and my ex-girlfriend were just kind of texting about that the other day. The one that I left because she didn't get into Scientology. Um, Maybe there was more to it than that, but that was kind of a, a big deal. So with the girlfriend, um, absolutely is the answer to that question. And the way it was is my mother in particular, my father was just sort of never or kind of around or kind of a shy introvert. But my mother, um, as part of the indoctrination, would basically encourage, there was always a distance between it made me super codependent with my parents and the cult leader and the outside world is bad. So however, my mom would judge my friends and she hated all of them except for the bad ones. She liked those, the good ones. She's, it sounds bad, man. I don't want to talk shit about my mother, but it was a very um, controlling. Everybody's bad except for bad people. Those are good. If that makes any sense. The only people that were allowed in my life, I, my mother were people that were kind of not good for me. And then the people that were, were, pushed away because they might be dangerous. So it was really shitty, man. Um, my parents weren't abusive physically. They're good people. They would, they're totally normal. If you meet them, you'd never, you might be able to tell there's a sign, they're a Scientologist, but in general, they're just um, normal people. But I'm not the only Scientologist that would say that you don't really have friends outside of Scientology, man. And the, and the longer you get in, I mean, you do have your WOG friends, but they're not close because you speak a different language when, when you're inside and you want to be around those people. So the longer you go in, the more friends and family you're going to lose. And that's why it squeezes you into like this bubble. And the deep, by the time you get up to OT8, you'll have no family friend. You're, you'll just be like, in, like Jason Begay said in, that, in the going clear, like spun in your head and you're like this dot in the back of your eye. It really just squeezes your reality and squeezes your life to such a point where you can't even date another Scientologist that's, in the, that's also OT8. The higher up you go, the slimmer the pickings on friends, the slimmer the pickings on um, uh, possible wife or whatever. So it just, um, friends get less and less as you go up the bridge to total freedom. So there's a couple of abusive practices I'm familiar with. 
<clears throat> uh, one of them I'm intimately familiar with. A friend of mine, she's since moved away. Uh, she believes that the uh, purification rundown killed her ex-husband because uh, they wow. they took him off his uh, heart medication and put him through the purif. And uh, mm -hmm. he didn't survive the experience. But that's one of the abusive um, practices I'm aware of. Were you, did you go through the purification rundown inside of Scientology? Three times? Three times. Two times while I was high. So I had to do it three times. So were you still um, smoking but, weed and shit while you were in Scientology? No, man. That was the one of the, that was the thing that got me really into Scientology is I got caught. Weed was like a no-no and I didn't smoke it too much, but I did at, right out of high school. I played in a band and I got into it, but I was trying to resist because I, growing up, I knew all this shit was bad. So I never did weed, man. I didn't really drink any alcohol. Um, I was in. Uh, around 19 or 20 when I first started smoking and then weed. And then that was about it. But even then, bro, because of the training I had and the ethics conditions and stuff, which I, even though I knew Scientology is bullshit, this stuff was going in bit, bit by bit. So I always knew I was fucking up my brain in a bad person by smoking weed. And so when I finally got, I got caught, uh, this is back when it was illegal. I got caught by my roommate and I made a decision that I could lie to my parents and just say I got kicked, I could make up some excuse, or I could get my ethics in, stop smoking weed and destroying my brain, call up Jim Hamry at the Ventura Mission and become a Scientologist and get my parents' love, get my fucking ethics in. And it was that point right there when I, they were away on vacation in New Mexico. I called up Jim Hamry at the Ventura Mission. I said, I'm ready to do this shit. From that point on, man, I went through the personality transformation. I gave myself over to this and I felt like it was the right thing to do due to the 10 years of indoctrination. And I knew my ethics were out and I was finally ready to do Scientology. It's so crazy to even say this shit, man, because I can see how I fell into it basically by thinking that marijuana was bad. And ironically, weed is the thing that caused me to deprogram the fastest. That's why they don't want you to smoke it, by the way, because the programming won't take, probably not, if you're getting high. I did the pure of three times, the first two times. Uh, this is a complete no-no, by the way. This is crazy. I mean, heavy ethics conditions for this shit. I would get high in my car and then go into the pure uh, because I wasn't accepting it yet. Like I told you that incident when I got kicked out, that happened after my uh, second or tier up, and then I finally did the third one correctly because I committed to Scientology. I hope that answers your question without ring. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, if you can recall, like, what were your physical symptoms during the purification rundown? Wow, man. It, it, I since come to learn that it's really damaging. You could actually... Well, like you said, your friend died. You, it's so destructive. It's so bad overdosing vitamin, sweating in there for, for five hours. It says that you're going to turn stuff on. Your, your skin's going to turn purple. You're gonna, um, it says that if you had an acid trip, that's going to come out through your fucking skin, stuff like that. So bad shit's actually happening to you physically, but they have you reorient it to the fact that this is good. Stuff is flushing out of your tissues and your system. So that shit actually did happen. Um, it's exhausting. It doesn't feel good. And actually, you know what it's designed to do, my man. And when you actually pass it, because sometimes you're on it for a month, sometimes you're on it for three months. It is actually part of the whole system that you're being set up for. It's not just damaging you physically, but it's getting you set up to, I mean, it's, it's not torture, but it's, um, it's the, the big thing that happened to me when I completed it was I was so mentally out of it. I remember driving home and being spaced out of my mind and thinking I was stoned. And I was like, if Scientology can make me feel high like I do now, and I'm not using drugs, I fucking found what I'm looking for. And that was the EP. That's when they end you off. And if you get deeper into how this con works, it's actually you pass that. I mean, not in Narconon, that's a different thing. But in Scientology, I mean, it's not different at all in terms of what they do, but it's, if you become in Sci uh, Scientology church, it's just one of the steps. Um, and we know they recruit from Narcanon, of course, because it's, Scient it's Scientology. But um, 
what they do is it's designed to break you down so that you'll be easy to, easier to take the next step and more and more. It, it's a brainwashing thing. I felt spaced out of my mind and they said, you're done. You completed it. So I thought I was winning. Every time they traumatize you beyond a certain point in your mind, you actually go into a euphoric state and they do that constantly. That's how you, that's when they say you have a win in auditing. That, that's what Scientology is all about is going beyond the natural capacity of the mind. And you start to kind of lose it a little bit. And you go into this incredible high, and um, it was no different on the pier. Okay, well, that's that's let's that's that's our talk about uh, what happened to you inside <clears throat> when you decided to leave. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that they weren't really in favor of you leaving. They never are. <laughs> There's no, it's like the Hotel California, man. You can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave because it's a mental prison. So even when you leave physically, that's just step one, dude. A lot of people never actually leave it mentally and they have problems with it without realizing it for the rest of their lives. Did they, um, cause you left during a time before, I think my opinion is they've lost their ability to really expend resources at this point on going mm -hmm. after people who are trying to leave unless those people are True. really high profile. Mm -hmm. I, I, but you left at a time when I think they probably still had resources. Were they bothering you? No, only because I was, a, I, I'm a non threat. I mean, the only threat that I am is that my parents are fairly well off and they, they wouldn't want to lose them. But, but I was living in my car for a while. I lost everything and I wasn't attacking them. I was just reading books on what the fuck happened. So I didn't start really, I spoke out a little bit here and there. Like you said, they didn't have the resources. They definitely had more back then in 2008 when I left. And now it almost feels like because of all the work that, I mean, you and a million other people, a lot of people have given their lives in this fucking fight, man. Because they, they've done the work that they have, somebody like me can come out and it's a breeze today. And, it, and I didn't get hit in 2008 when they still were hitting people, mostly because I'm low profile. I wasn't really saying too much. And I was just trying to figure out what was going on. So what are they, why, why would they be threatened by me? You know, I wasn't um, hiding. I wasn't quiet about, oh, I'm just going to pretend to be a Scientologist so I can keep my family. As soon as I knew my, I was con, I... Unlike a lot of ex Scientologists, I was going to fucking, I was going to sack, I didn't give a shit what I lost. I was like, I'm going to become who I really am and I'm whatever it takes. And I'm not going to live a lie anymore. That was, that was almost like day one. I just didn't know how long that was, what, what was actually going to happen. I figured after two years, I'd have my life rebuilt, my, might lose everything. Or I, I had no idea that 12 years later now, 12 and a half years later, it would have this much of an impact. I mean, my life's a hell of a lot better now, but I didn't realize it would take so goddamn long, but it was still worth it. I mean, what do you want to, I don't, I understand why people, there's a lot, there's some people that hang on to their, they, they pretend to be Scientologists. I get it. They don't want to lose their family and it depends on the situation. But my situation was, I was trying to be, um, I was, you know, an actor, I was going to acting class. I was trying to be more real and authentic. And I was discovering who I was through that. And that was conflicting with my indoctrination at a certain point. And I just wasn't willing to fucking, I was so unbelievably outraged that this kind of shit exists and that this calm wasn't figured out by my ancestors. So I and other people don't have to incarnate into it. It's just crazy that something so destructive hasn't been figured out already and eradicated and not just Scientology. There's other systems too, man. I just found it so fucking disgusting. I didn't want to lose my family. That shit sucked. I tried to hold on to him. I fucking, it was a horrible process of letting go, but I was never going to backtrack on, um, okay, I'll compromise if I, because I, dude, even I tried to negotiate a little bit with my parents, but it was so obvious that they're Scientologists and you're either, they're either going to suck me back in, in a subtle manipulative way. Well, I have to leave permanently. There was no fucking black and white or gray area in between, despite trying to negotiate that for a couple of years. It didn't work. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that's, that's good that you didn't get harassed by them. And also, sorry, to, really. sorry to hear that you had to, that you were in, you know, it ended up that you were living out of your car. That's a tough situation to get oh, out I of. I mean, people have had it way worse. I mean, Nathan Rich, I mean, was 
if you listen to his story, you ever heard Nathan's story? I mean, I had it easy, my man. I wasn't in the Sea Org. I wasn't born into the Sea Org like a kid. Can you imagine? I mean, dude, I got it so easy. And and even I can't even imagine like the Sea Org members coming out of this or the people like that have been, you know, gotten far deeper into it than I am. Um, it, it just must. They, I mean, some of these people just because of what they went through, they're not going to be able to heal for their entire life. And it's just fucked up and sad, man. Well, I think, you know, you know um, the media wench who's on the show with me sometimes <clears throat> brings up that, you know, when we deal with the X community, that we have to understand that some of the people are still, you know, that, that some of the mentality of it, they're, they bring it into their, their the next set of endeavors that they, they engage in, that they, <clears throat> you know, that w without getting, without throwing anybody under the bus, the X Scientology yeah. community is, um, I'm going to call it very clicky to say the least. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and second that. Very, very clicky. Um, you know, whatever we're, <clears throat> we have to set almost some of that a, aside. Almost a cult, uh, yeah. Almost a, um, another kind of trap in itself. If you get to like any click, if you get too immersed in it. Right. We have to set some of that stuff aside because we want access to get information to put out content. Right. So, right, <clears throat> right. but we don't make any, we don't make any qualms about like what we believe and, you know, and you know, there's, there's been a couple situations where we've spoken our mind and, uh, we were, you know, a little concerned that maybe people would have thought we threw them under the bus. And we've actually been pleasantly surprised that, uh, nobody, nobody, uh, took that from what we were saying. There was a, <clears throat> there was a situation recently with, a a certain former Scientologist out of Los Angeles, who was a sort of, a I, well, I guess, a, sort of a well-known drama queen. And when we kind of went over it, you know, we, we sort of, you know, we, we had our say about a few things that were going on and, you know, we, we understood that because of the clicky nature of the X community that we'd taken a risk and we were just real happy that none of that happened. But I think kind of the reason that didn't happen was because we come to this like really honestly, we're not, we're I not out tell. to get anybody. We're not, you know, we're Same not here. trying to throw anybody under the bus. And if people are still traumatized right. by their experience in the cult and that still plays out in their life after they've left, you know, we understand that. But if people's behavior so I, is, so is what we think is bad, we're still going to say, you know, something about Same it. Um, yeah, yeah exactly. That was really well said, man. Yeah. I mean, like I've never been in the cult. I wasn't even raised religious. So like I try to, you know, I try to <clears throat> try not to lay down any heavy judgments on people as far as like the, 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 I guess, yeah, I'll call it the clicky nature of the X community. And there's a ways in which you, you know, I'm smart enough to know how to work that to my advantage too. You like, you get. You yeah, get a couple of them to like you. And then all of a sudden, all of these people want to come on and talk to you because a couple of them like you. And there's no, there's no problem with working that. Oh, well, that's good that you got that. I don't, I don't have, a, um, I don't really think a hell of a lot of them. Like I'm, I don't like, I'm not in a lot of those groups. There's a couple of groups that I really do like. And I, I, I the people that I trust kind of the people that have evolved beyond Scientology. You know what I mean? All together that walk the whole route out. If you will, there's a route in and then you have to walk the fucking whole thing back out. Some of the people get halfway and they say, they pitch their tent and they're like, here and no further, you know? And I've been in those communities and they, they, it's games within games within games, my man, they just spin around and it's like, I'm looking for the way out of here. So I don't have to have this shit in my head. And you guys are still debating as to whether or not the TRs are damaging. Of course they are. It's like, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And also I, yeah, yeah. Go, go. Well, what, I, what I'm thinking is like that it's not like there's nothing of value to be taken from any of it. That would be a dumb position to take. But it's just you have to not you, but anybody would have to be like on the whole is this is is believing in some of this worth. Being stuck here, worth not mm -hmm. making any progress, because if you learn something in there and like, you know, 10 or 20 years later, you realize that that was a good thing to learn. You can still bring that with you. But as you, I think as you're getting out, you kind of have to just be like, no, that's Scientology shit. Let's 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 focus on something else right now. And I think I think a lot of people did try to bring some of it with them. And I mm -hmm. I, I can never like <clears throat> understand what it's like to leave a cult. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm not going <clears> to <throat> sorry, I'm not going to lay down like heavy character judgments on on that kind of stuff. But I also <clears throat> I also understand that, you know, sometimes when people are trying to leave, it's it can be counterproductive for them to get in a, into a highly clicky environment where there's kind of the Definitely. popular people and the non-popular people within the movement and stuff. Um, 
Exactly. Some, someone that immediately comes to my mind. I don't know if you know this, but this is a person whose name I'm not even afraid to drop. Do you know who Andy Nolch is? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Are you, I can't believe that you just threw that dude's name out there. I mean, I don't want to talk shit about Andy. He's an, he seems like a nice guy, and he actually has a lot of knowledge that's somewhat I agree with, but he's fucking... Like, come on, dude. Is he joking or is he serious? So that's funny because we thought it was all a gag and we were we had him on a few times. And <laughs> no I don't know shit. if you know about the situation where he drew that big old dick on that lady's memorial after she got murdered. I mean, there's funny things about Andy Nolch, but it's not his comedy routines. But um, she had been it's it was tragic. She was just walking home from a comedy gig and she was murdered. And he went out onto a field and I don't know if he used like, um, like the chalk they would use on a baseball field. He used something and drew just a big old dick on the field where her memorial was going to be Jeez. the next day. I heard, I did hear about that. That's, and he got called out. It was a big deal, right? Oh, he got arrested like, and shit. Like, I remember that. That's, that's when I like, so, I mean, I, I don't want to be a psychologist, but he's so, is he just fucked up a little bit or what? And why, why the fuck, why would anybody do that? Um, I think that he got like, <laughs> Our best guess is that he's like one of those dudes who's hella mad at feminism. And so because it was a woman, like he, he just kind of took it to be that like, because they were having a, 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 a memorial for her, that the memorial for her was like hating men or something. That was the, that was the, the impression we got. Like when he tried to explain it to the local news, which you, if you're accused oh, of a crime, you, know, you don't, you don't, you don't ever talk to the fucking local news. <laughs> Shut you're the fuck the up. Man, if you're ever a, if you did it or you didn't do it, shut the fuck up. We heard about it and all we heard that it was a former Scientologist and then it was Australia. And then somebody said, oh, it's probably Andy Nolch. Yeah, there's only one that you'd guess. And, right? No. Only... And then we were like, nah. And then it was Andy Nolch. <laughs> and no, we were surprised too because we didn't think that, like, we didn't think that that was going to be, you know, well, first of all, you just don't predict anybody doing that particular thing. But like, we didn't, we, you know, we joked saying it was him, but then we found out it was him and it was surprising. And it seems like, you know, it seems like people, people, when they leave, they go a couple ways. Um, the way mm -hmm. that you went is I think a rare way. Cause you, I do too. You eventually came to like, we noticed on your first video that we watched that you're like, no, this stuff is fucking stupid. And not a lot of people say that not a lot of the exes will ever say so directly that this stuff is fucking stupid. I got a little of that from Leah Remini during her show. Mm -hmm. Sometimes she yeah. would say, this is crazy. Yeah. These beliefs are crazy, yeah. but not a lot of the exes do that. And, um, what do you, I agree. Do you have any, do you have any ideas? Maybe why not a lot of the exes will just say this stuff is crazy. Has it, have you ever thought, have you thought about it much? Well, I have. And maybe I that's a great question, by the way, man, because I honestly don't know the answer. I just, and I do agree. I don't think my situation's like super common, but I don't understand why the fuck not. Why can't you just take a, I mean, all you have to do is look at Steve's book and you should be able to figure out uh, your cult used hypnosis. It got you in through manipulation. Your cult leader lied about everything. This is the same for any cult. So why wouldn't you have enough self-respect? to let that go and be angry about that and feel all the misemotion and build up your life to be who you were meant to be uh, if this bullshit didn't come into your life. I don't understand personally why more people don't do that. In fact, when I came out, I was really shocked and surprised that the X community was not really a hell of a whole lot X. It depends on the people you're talking about because I'm not talking about everybody. But there's, they do, in general, remain stuck at varying levels rather than going on day one, this is bullshit, I want to heal myself, I want to remove this shit from my brain, and I'll, I'm going to work hard at it. I'm going to stop, I'm going to train myself to use English words and stop thinking and talking like a Scientologist. That took a lot of work, by the way, to get to stop talking and thinking like a Scientologist. But why the fuck don't they do that? What, are the, what the hell's wrong with them? Like you should have enough self-respect to realize you've been conned, accept that. Don't be a victim about it and fucking get the fuck out of it. You know, to me, like when I, you know, I was, 
I'd watched videos and stuff, but before, basically before we started doing uh, podcasting and streaming, I didn't really get involved with the X community because I maybe thought it wasn't my place, but I was like, Hey, if I'm going to do any mm -hmm. journalism around this <laughs> journalism, if I'm going to do proper trolling around this, I'm going mm -hmm. to need to like get into these communities. And immediately, mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was, but immediately when I was in, in, for example, SPs or us, I could tell fucking immediately who was a former Scientologist and who was like journalists and who were like looky loos in the group. I could tell immediately. And wow, some of the people wow. surprised me. Some of the people surprised me, right? Like some of the exes I thought were like journalists. I don't remember any exact names, but then some of them did not surprise me. You know, some of the, mm -hmm. and maybe some of the people who are more popular and like do a little bit of the gatekeeping, maybe they do, maybe some of that is like residual, like structural stuff that they are, they brought with them from the cult. Like I said, I have to try not to say too much here because I, I ignore that I stuff you. for access, right? Because I have yeah, to yeah, have I access. You. I can't just keep playing Scientology TV. I have to have access to some of the, I some, hear you. some of the X's, but I do see like, you know, Media Wench says it better than I do. She's like, hey, these people used to be in a cult. Do you expect them to all of a sudden not act like they're in a cult? That's true, too, man. It's, it's, a, it's both at the same time, man. I, I can understand why they don't be a little more aggressive in regaining their self-respect and letting it go. And at the same time, I completely understand it. That's why it's so weird, man. It's like you're both a victim and a perpetrator when you're in the cult. So you have to wrestle with that when you get out. And then you also recognize, and it gives you, at least it has me, a lot more compassion because I was that person. So I, I'm not better than that. Um, it, it's a dichotomy of holding them responsible and then also having enough compassion and sympathy for, uh, because you deeply understand the situation. And I wrestle with that all the time, man. But I definitely am leaning, I'm not mis emotional about this experience anymore. I mean, I have a lot of pain and a lot of stuff to get off with these videos. You're just. Uh, and absolutely amazing i couldn't i can't believe how much this is helping i didn't realize how much is sitting there but i and i do recognize that scientology victimizes people but i don't feel like a victim anymore you know what i mean i dealt with that shit and I, i'm you know most of it is gone um so i i finally reached that point where i'm not walking around angry all the time i'm actually happy which feels weird and uh, i completely understand and yet at the same time, like you said, you call out people. You don't just let them get away with stuff if you feel it, it's not okay and you need to call it out. Or you're not going to lie to yourself and pretend, oh, yeah, I really like that person. And they're all, you know, you, you say what is, but also not with hate in your heart and with some understanding. And also, that's a good way. I mean, I tried to get my parents and other people out by telling them how wrong they are. And I've seen people go to the Scientology Center and bash these people. I'm not going to name names, but I, I did now the same thing funny. myself. Yeah, and I agree. And I did the same shit myself. <laughs> but when I was doing it, it was coming out of like a lot of anger and stuff. And now um, I haven't protested for a while, but it, it would be a totally different story because um, I don't know, man, the more you understand yourself and you hear yourself, the more I think you can kind of like relate to other people and not be project and be so harsh on them. And at the same time, it also makes you more harsh because you're like, come on, man, like put this shit aside, go burn your L. Ron Hubbard books. It doesn't matter if you were a class 12. It doesn't mean shit in the real world. So fucking burn that shit and go on an adventure of finding out what you were supposed to be before this thing interrupted your life and you allowed yourself, because it's not just being a victim, you allowed yourself to hide because it gives certain comforts and it, and it can take the pain away. It's not all manipulation. It provides something subconsciously, like L. Ron Hubbard was my father figure that I wasn't getting from my real father. So there's all sorts of Freudian reasons and shit. I don't want to tell people what to do, man. It's just like, it'd be, I just thought when I was in the X community that everybody was on the same page as I was, but I, I just realized some of them are going to stay at that level forever because they want to. Right. I also, you know, you'd mentioned burning the books, but I, I, there's the flip side of that is like a lot of people kept those books and it's been valuable to journalists, uh, particularly like Tony Ortega is a guy like, we're mm -hmm. like super fortunate that we're going to have him on next uh, Thursday. And cool, I feel man. like 
he's more of a serious, like kind of uh, investigative journalist than we are. But I also feel like, and I'm not going to ask him about this on the fucking show, right? Because I don't want to put him on the spot. But I also feel like he's similar <laughs> situated, similarly situated to us, where he can't, if he, if he believes, you know, this, that, or the other thing going on in the X community is bad and it's cult like. I don't think he's in in a position where he can necessarily say anything about it because he'll lose access. But I think that yeah, I know, I know. But I like it's it's not not surprising to me. I guess maybe maybe we'll maybe we'll end maybe we'll end here. Maybe 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 you haven't thought about this much, but because of the other stuff we cover, it's not surprising to me that his Scientology has a harder time recruiting normies. That that you see them sort of trying to reach their tentacles into conspiracy theory communities to try to get people who are already distrustful of like medical science and whatnot to get in. That's on what got me in just, just to end off that that's, I always felt there was something more to life. It captures a lot of seekers, man. It captures people that don't quite buy into the nine to five. I came out of the womb going, ah, oh, fuck this. man. I want to be an artist. I, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I knew right away. So I still believe there's, but if that's what Scientology captures the most is people that want a little bit more. And that can be, a, that's something that should be a good thing, I think. And it can absolutely, um, you could easily get caught into a cult by already thinking outside the box because Scientology sells that. And they're all about conspiracies. They'll even sell you um, I'm not saying conspiracies aren't real, but you have to understand the way they present it. They they present it. It's not factual, but they present it like, yes, fuck the system. L1 Hubbard was down with fuck the system. That was really, really attractive, by the way, about Scientology. You felt like you were taken on the system. L1 Hubbard was a badass motherfucker, like, you know, broke into government offices through Operation Snow White. Fuck yeah, dude. I want to be a part of that. That. That captures a lot of people. That was a, a large percentage of what got me staying in there. Right. And it's, you know, rebelling against the system, there's value to it, but not if you have to give up your, your life for it. And the thing is, <laughs> I mean, in that case, you're rebelling against one system and joining another one that's going to, you know, arguably exactly. more harmful, like argue, you know, we it's, could we could try to split hairs crazy? here or whatever, like like governments do bad <laughs> things. And you said, like, of course, conspiracies aren't real. People conspire to do bad shit every day. It's just a matter of, of like, course. just a matter of like, they aren't all real. Yeah, not only that, the way that Scientology sells it is that's a whole nother subject. I, you know, I know we're going to end off, but. There's definitely conspiracy. Scientology itself is a conspiracy. One man is fucking enslaving other people from beyond the via, grave no less right now that's a conspiracy in itself if you were to tell scientologists that their cult leader was a fucking drug addict he was doing fucking moon child rituals with jack parsons out in fucking pasadena and while he's telling scientologists never to take drugs i'm getting in trouble for smoking weed this motherfucker's doing so many drugs smoking five packs of cigarettes a day that motherfucker had an aide going around dude carrying a fucking ashtray you know, light his cigarettes and the ash. It's like um, the way they sell the conspiracies and the way they sell this man. It's something that if you're already thinking outside the box, like I said, and you don't know anything about Scientology, like I didn't, because we didn't have the fucking internet when I was growing up. Then there's a lot of second gens like me that were captured um, just because uh, they're rebels, man. They're fucking uh, nonconformists, whatever you want to call it. Scientology has shit loads of them and in fact i'd say the majority of the people there are nonconformists. well except when it comes and the to irony is except they that's the irony like you said you think you're anti-establishment and you're getting into something that's so establishment it's going to that's it's so ironic dude that i went in there to help people and the only help i've ever done in my life is recently by telling, getting on YouTube and telling people about the trap. For the first time, I'm actually helping people. And yet that's why we all went into Scientology, man. We really thought we were helping people. I thought we were fucking saving the planet, dude. And yet it's so ironic to think that you're so free and you're in the most ins insidious mental prison you could possibly be in. It's yeah, crazy, man. I see. 
like what happened my if I was going to put Scientology into a nutshell, it was a cult of personality that turned into a structured cult. Yeah. And um, I in the age of the Internet, I just see echoes of that all over the place. And it may be my bias. It may be my bias from my experience with Scientology. And but I'm fine with that if that's my bias. Right. If I'm a little hypersensitive to that because of my experience with Scientology and them, mm-hmm. you know, having basically stolen a good friend from me and my friend group. Um, if I'm hypersensitive that. to that, that's fine. You know what I'm saying? But it also, I think, mm-hmm. has given me some insight and I into just like super popular people who tell people they have all the answers. Um, there's, you know, a lot of public intellectuals who have a bit of a cult of personality around them. And I don't think that they're going to form something like Scientology. I think that was very much of its time, too, because when it was formed, like in post-war America, like Mm -hmm. I think that there was Mm -hmm. a unique set of circumstances. But I I also see like I also see a lot of just kind of red flags in other other communities, be they conspiracy communities or communities around public intellectuals that everybody thinks has all the answers. And I I think having studied Mm -hmm. Scientology and having talked to some of the former Scientologists, you know, ranging all the way from... (laughs) Andy Nolch to uh, Mark Bunker. Those are the two, like, in wow, the anti Scientology range. On one, that's on one the range, hand. man. You got the badass and you got the fucking, I don't even know what to call Andy, man. But that, you know what? I, I, it doesn't matter, though. As you know, being an ex, I, I find it fascinating people like you that, you know, I, I'm sorry about your friend, by the way, man. I, I see that that's probably what drove you into this, but it's so fascinating to see people like you that haven't lived it that um you you're actually removed from it so you make a lot more sense than the people that have lived it some of them you know what i mean because you you have, you can see what it is um i find it fascinating that people that didn't grow up in it find it fascinating and do a show on it your show's fantastic man and i i mean you say more shit i, I think i learned more from watching your shit than some of the ex scientologist stuff so it's like um what can i ask you a question if you don't mind yeah uh, by to, all means to maybe the car the goes both ways let's go <laughs> I just really wanted to know what drives you and people like you to be so, to give up so much of your time to fight for a good cause when it's not even something you'd ever have to do or bother with. Um, there's two answers. Um, I'll give the, I'll give the, the, the good one first. Uh, the good one okay. is that, um, you know, if I can, it doesn't have to be Scientology, ah. but if I can through, through humor and trolling, Cause I just think trolling is like a, a form of like a form of debate or whatever, where you try to like tie mm-hmm. somebody's argument up and make you make fun of it. If I can like yeah. stop somebody from joining, you know, I'm not going to stop somebody from joining Scientology, but if I could like, for example, I think like, I think like fans of Jordan Peterson act like a cult sometimes. And if I can stop somebody from getting involved in that by making fun yeah. of that guy, I think I've done a very good thing. And the other answer is that, my ego demands that I am known. But how does Scientology feed your ego? Like surely there's other endeavors that would get you more publicity or you could be more interested in. You have to be, it has, why Scientology specific? Oh, it's uh, personal. It's other avenue. It's personal. Yeah, exactly. It's personal. It's your friend, right? It's, it's personal because of that. And um, well, there's two people that I've known, um, you know, one just disappeared, the other one. I think they killed the guy and, um, Jesus, really? Yeah. I think they we'll ki- talk about that privately. No, that was a guy who they stopped. They got him to stop taking his heart medication and put him through the Purif and he had a heart attack. I mean, they do a lot of that, man. A lot of people died and malpractice and suicide themselves. There's so many dead bodies, dude, in that fucking cult. So, and I also, I've also just kind of, I came out of like, like right around when we started doing the podcast, I'd come out of the, I'll call it like the online atheist community. I'd come out of mm-hmm. that, like kind of jaded towards that set of belief, not towards that. I mean, I still don't believe in any kind of higher powers or whatever, but mm-hmm. I, I came, I came out of that community and wanted to bring like the critical thinking and the skepticism and even some of the humor with me, but I wanted to leave behind, um, I guess like a lot of the, a lot of popular atheists really, really, really don't like Muslims. Right. So I wanted to like leave some of that behind. So we had a local music show and then uh, the next, the next thing we did was a show making fun of like the current crop of public intellectuals 
mostly celebrity atheists. The next thing was a show dedicated specifically to conspiracy. And the last thing we added was Scientology because it seemed like with everything else we were talk talking about, Scientology was something that me and the media wench were both fascinated with, but it was also kind of like the missing piece to like the other stuff we were doing that, that it, it, it was such a dramatic demonstration of cult like adherence to an ideology and something that people understood because of all the press that had happened around it uh, previous, you know, we just started the Scientology stream maybe a year ago, right towards the end oh, of really? Leah's show. And um, mm -hmm. we had done Scientology great, great stories show, on our man. political show the whole time because there's always there was always audio or video to play about some dumb Scientology shit that happened that week. <laughs> but we figured that like that it was the it was like the missing piece to like this sort of like extremism and control group stuff that we were sort of delving into. And it was like a stark example. And we've done other stuff on the Scientology show. We say Scientology and cults like where the media wench comes from. There's a, a far I'm they're called Bethel and in the rest of the, the rest of the state or the rest of the country, they're not that influential. They just have like a little church, but up in Redding, California, they're buying up all the property. Hmm. You could imagine that. I don't know where you've ever heard of that before. And so we've done a it's little so bit on universal, man. <laughs> we've done, well, we've done a little bit on Bethel and I felt like, I felt like this, like, it wasn't like we were really missing something, but that if we were going to add something else, like that was going to be like, not like a local music show or like something about entertainment that it was going to have to be cults. And because me and the media went <laughs> before all this, we would just sit down and watch Scientology TV and get high. Right. <laughs> and so, and so it was like the, it was like obvious. It was like the obvious next thing if we were going to add another stream. And I'm real glad we did it because I feel like the audience on Twitch, um, you know, it waxes and wanes. Sometimes we're doing real good on Twitch. Sometimes we're not. It probably has a lot to do with whether or not I'm burned out. Like the, the shelter in place has burned me out because not having people in the studio with me and trying to manage, yeah. you know, so when you see Thursdays, it's just me and the media wench, but sometimes the shows are up to five people trying to manage five people on remote connections with varying kinds of internet. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's taxing it, it like get, it hits your brain. But, um, but back to what I was talking about. Yeah. I just felt like Scientology in some ways was like the missing piece that was going to kind of tie everything together. And also it's like fun to make fun of it. Like, come on. It is, man. I, I can definitely agree with you that, uh, about that now, but God, I wouldn't have a few years ago, man. Or I, I definitely would have. Been, I mean, I wouldn't even be talking to you uh, yeah. twelve years ago, man. I would be writing you up. I'd be writing a KR on your ass, man. I come across your show, and I'd be like, "Fuck this guy. He's evil." Well, I got to tell you, the best thing in the world that could ever happen to us would be Scientology trying to come for us. Because you know how much you know how much we could grift on that. You know how much fucking Patreon money we'd get, or fucking GoFundMe. They Help even, Scientology is coming even, for me. They don't even realize that everything they they don't realize that the community in general like hates them and so anything they do to attack it's just going to cause that many more people and that much more popularity for those that they attack um like you effect. said though they don't yeah exactly but like you said they don't what i mean they, they don't still have, have teeth but they but they don't have they only know. have property now yeah i don't know what their fucking end game is man you, any idea um with the property and the miscavige and Oh, well, the property, the, the, pro the property is easy. I mean, they're just trying to make money for the people at the top. It's not, I don't think. It, yeah. Well, no shit. And also to make, I think as a church, they have to prove that they're spending or whatever and not right. putting it in coffers. It's all, it's all a scheme. Huh? And, and amazing, amazing though, that, you know, when I was in the bubble, they only have like 20,000 to 25,000 actual members, including Sea Org, Public, all of them. That's the actual numbers. Now. Um, when I was in, they convinced us that we had 13, 14, 15 million people. And they're still telling them that. And within the Truman show, you actually believe that man, even though all the orgs are empty, you'll never go around and see them all. So whatever they tell you. And when you, I believe there was millions and millions of Scientology and come to find out there's less than 30,000 when I got out, that was a fucking enormous shock because it, I couldn't wrap my head around it because it was so obvious that we had millions of members and to find out, you know, Dude, think about how much damage this little organization has caused with fucking 30,000 members. I mean, it's, it's the amount of lives that this virus has infected and the amount of damage that it's done. Some, someday somebody needs, that cult needs to be brought to justice so that there can be people that can fucking breathe fine with all that destruction. I mean, it's, it's impossible to even talk about or put into words like how 
much suffering has come from such a small group and from, and from one guy, man, fucking L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah, like what I tell people sometimes when they come on or what, like when they're in the chat and they're like, what the fuck's going on here? They're like, this, they're like, it's just jokes. I'm like, well, it is, it is jokes. I'm like, but you know, we believe what we're saying. We, we care yeah, about yeah. the things that we're talking about around here. We're just not, we're just not educators, you know, we're clowns. And, um, yeah, but that can be a form of educating too. Yeah, of course, of course, uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, that's, uh, and, and I think that insulates us from a lot of the problems or a lot of the drama that happens inside the ex Scientology yeah. community. Because, smart move, smart move. Because, well, nobody, I mean, if, if people in the ex Scientology community got mad at us, that would just be fucking their problem because they're, you know, we're not, we're not part of like, like Ashley, who uh, the media, when she comes on the show, she lives 10 minutes from me. You know, all the people involved in this all live in San Jose or the San Jose area. And so it's like, we're, we're just a different scenario. Whereas the, you know, the, the ex Scientology community or even Scientology itself is so spread out without that many people having, you know, real like relationships with one another that it just kind of insulates us from any of the potential problems that we might have, you know, if we're criticizing or, or whatever. Plus like, Plus, like we criticize, we criticize behavior uh, in the X community. Yeah. We don't criticize people's character. If we're going to criticize someone's yeah, character, exactly. they better be rich and powerful, right? Otherwise, like, what do you do? Yeah, you yeah, shit yeah. on somebody that's like probably hurting. Exactly. I agree, man. Totally about that. That's a good point. So, hey, hey Doug, much... before we get out of here, what's the yeah, name yeah. of your channel? And like, w w like, what's what's your upcoming video about? The one I'm sure it's not. I'm sure if it's if it's not out yet, what's Dude, the I was next just one about? Finishing it up right before this, man. I was I've been going at it for like 40 hours on this fucking thing. How do I explain it? Well, uh, basically, uh, first of all, days but not confused is the channel. I put out four videos in the last month, um, and the structure is going to be I'm going to talk about my story on the various parts. And then there's going to be in between parts, which is what one of these next, the next video is where I talk about something about the technology or something that of Scientology related. So this one actually was brought up based on the last video where I talked about my dad getting into it by finding his ruin. So it has to do with jumping off from that and then actually going into a little bit of the, well, you got to see it, man. You got to see it. I will watch I like, it on I like Thursday. This one, man. All right. All right. Cool. I mean, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I like it. Well, hey, oh, thanks. I put a little, I put a, real quick, I, I put a little movie together uh, featuring um, Ronald DeWolf, who, who, who was uh, L. Ron Hubbard's son. He's on on the and 26th. Into, no, you're Jamie DeWolf. Yeah, uh, that guy's Oh, Ron DeWolf. Oh, no, no, that's different. Okay. We've and watched some Ron DeWolf son. videos. I got, this, I got these clips. Yeah, that guy was deep, deep, deep into what's going on. So I put some clips together kind of show the audience what we're going to be covering in the depth of this con rather than just, you, you have to see it, man. But um, I was just going to tell the story and take Scientology apart, starting from the bottom, but you actually got to start from the core and go backwards. So that's kind of what that video is about. And I really appreciate you having me on, Dave. I absolutely love your. Oh, your I show. really, really appreciate cool you. Uh, I really appreciate you kind of taking to us because like it's uh, people pretty hot and cold on us because of the, 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 the way that we do our content. So that's real good. And I also I really you appreciate guys, I we, were, we were, I was super happy. Like I was super stoked when the media went, was like, Hey, you did a video about us. And I'm like, uh Oh, and then I watched the video. I'm like, yes. <laughs> Cause usually somebody does a Dude, video. I, about well, us. I didn't make you look bad, man. I fucking loved what you guys said. And you really, really helped me out and did a, a service. And you're also, you guys are absolutely hilarious. I was sitting over, I was belly laughing, listening to what you're saying. So I you were, like, here's okay. usually what somebody does a video about us. It's st stuff like this. This person is like... Dave, Dave, he needs anger management. You know, last time he came on, oh my goodness, he was furious. Like, yeah, they, they don't... Usually if somebody does a what video... What is that? Uh, that's a guy named Austin me, Bennett. Uh, I, I saw... I, yeah, yeah. That's a guy named Austin Bennett. Uh, just look up on our YouTube channel, Austin Bennett, and you'll find our saga with him. He don't like us. Okay, I saw a gal um, which kind of inspired me to do videos named Molly McMullen, and she, um, the, the way I got the idea to do yours is she had done a video on, on you, because you guys featured one of her videos, and she filmed it, and uh, she just started doing videos recently, because I remember seeing her do other Scientology videos. Anyway, she inspired me. Uh, I remember that she saw, she recorded you. Well, hey man, thanks so much for doing this. I'm glad we were able to work out the the technical challenges and I'm glad, we're kind of glad we yeah. did this separate from my Thursday show because we were able to maybe dedicate a little more time to it. I'm going to put this up on YouTube and I'll probably 
edit some of this together for like a shorter thing yeah. and run some of it on the upfront hour of our main show on Sunday so that I have less work to do. But plus, I also think like the bigger audience that shows up for our show on Sunday would really enjoy some of the clips from this interview. So thanks so much for taking the cool. time. This has been, uh, it's been Doug Kramer. He runs Dazed But Not Confused on YouTube. Everybody head on over there and subscribe to his YouTube channel. And uh, thanks so much, Doug. I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, Dave. I really appreciate it, man. Have a good night. There's a place in Florida where you've got friends. We'll help you present if you give us those ends. Don't call it a cult, you just don't understand.